commence fanboy rage in three, two, one. <laughs> With 48 votes, Final Fantasy IX. Okay, before I continue, let me just reiterate that this list was purely determined by user input. I had no personal influence on the outcome. So, for any of you Final Fantasy fans out there who are outraged that 6, 7, or any of the rest didn't win this time round, just remember that your rage has no place here. Nothing I say here is absolute, and your opinions may be your own, but don't go trying to force them over others. Okay, pumpkin? Now then, let's talk about Final Fantasy IX. If you ask me, I consider this particular installment to be the definitive Final Fantasy game. It isn't the best game in every category, but it is the biggest culmination of everything that makes this franchise what it is. I'll start as always with the gameplay. It's pretty much the same stuff we've been seeing from every Final Fantasy game. You explore a vast world entering different towns and dungeons to progress through your quest. You encounter enemies randomly and use various attacks to take them down. Defeating an enemy gives you experience, gill, ability points, and occasionally items. Final Fantasy IX returns to the class-based system that had been established in Final Fantasy VI and goes all out with it, making different characters very restricted in what they can and cannot do in battle. This forces your teammates to work together in order to succeed, which is something I greatly respect. The Limit Breaks also return, this time in the form of Trance Mode. After taking enough damage, your character's strength is increased and they acquire a different moveset for a short period of time. But let's move on to something else, like the story perhaps. In Final Fantasy IX, you play as Zidane Tribal, a bandit attempting to kidnap a princess. Gee, never heard that one before. But quickly stumbles into a struggle that will determine the fate of multiple worlds. You meet several characters along the way, uncover conspiracies, and achieve many other things. To tell you the truth, I think this story is a little on the mediocre side. I suppose it gets the job done, but it just felt bland. There's no big reveals, no clever misdirection, not even really any suspense. It basically boils down to, evil is spreading across our land, go kill this guy, bam, the end, roll credits. Maybe it's just me, but that's the way I see it. However, I think that the characters make up for that a bit. Clichéd as they may be, these characters are all a bucket of fun. Zidane is a carefree womanizer, Steiner is way too big for his britches, Dagger is playfully naive, Amarant is pleasantly arrogant, and Kuja, I don't even know how to describe him. Some think of him as a coward, I prefer to think of him as a passive villain. You know, it's strange. Usually I hate these type of personalities and characters, but they're played off so humorously that I find it impossible not to like. One thing I really enjoyed about this game was its level design. I know people don't often say that about RPGs, but this game made some very memorable levels and settings, such as the parallel universe Terra, the Kingdom of Alexandria, the technological Lindblom, and, my personal favorite, Memoria, a land literally consisting of the past memories of the main characters and those related to them. Such a cool concept! But I'm not gonna act like this game is perfect, because it isn't. Like I mentioned before, the story is pretty lackluster, and of course we shan't forget the disappointment that was Necron, but that's about it. Final Fantasy IX may not be the perfect Final Fantasy game, but it certainly is the most recognizable. To those who want to get into this series, I'd recommend playing this one first if you can, because it gives you a great sense of what the rest of the franchise has to offer. With effective combat, decent graphics for the PS1, a pleasant soundtrack, and some hilarious characters, Final Fantasy IX ranks a solid number 5. You know, I'm surprised. For as huge a phenomenon as RPGs were in the 90s, most of the games we've discussed so far were released relatively recently. So you know what? Let's take a look back at one of the classics. With 60 votes, Chrono Trigger. If I had to describe this game in two words, I would describe it as simple and fun. 
It's a game that knows what it's trying to accomplish and doesn't try to overcomplicate things. It's just straight up RPG action the way we love it, but with its own original twist. In Chrono Trigger, you take control of different characters on their quest to defend their land and stop the evil parasite Labos from destroying their world. To do this, they use a time machine and travel to multiple different times to gather items, experience, wisdom, and more recruits. It's a pretty simple story, but certainly an effective one. In terms of gameplay, Chrono Trigger is your RPG norm with a couple of fun gimmicks thrown in. Run around an overworld, encounter enemies, defeat enemies, etc, etc, what is this, the seventh time I've said that this countdown? Chrono Trigger actually has not only a unique battle system, but also a very enjoyable one. Each of your party members, as well as the enemies, have a timer on them that counts down in turns. Once it reaches zero, that character is allowed to perform an attack. This mechanic allowed for speed to play a large role in your stats, and it also made battles a bit more interesting than just back and forth gameplay. Another thing I liked about this battle system was the tech system. If two or three characters were all ready to attack at the same time, those characters can perform a double or even triple tech making for some flashy and incredibly powerful moves to unleash. This made bosses very fun to take out, especially on New Game Plus. Speaking of which, I should probably talk about the New Game Plus. Chrono Trigger popularized this new game element that added a lot of replay value to the game. After defeating Lavos for the first time, you can go back and restart the game with all the experience and items you've collected in your first game. Because of this, it is now possible to defeat Lavos within the first 10 minutes of the second playthrough. The game also rewards you for doing this, as you can get a different ending depending on what point you defeat Labos at. I know I've complained about multiple endings before, but this is one of the few games that I don't mind it in. Rather than the endings being decided by the outcome of one event during the game, the player actively seeks out the different endings, so it really does its job well. Good show, Ground of Trigger. Good show. One more thing I'm sure a good hunky you already know about this game is how it pushed the limits of what the SNES could do. In terms of graphics, there's a lot to like. It's not quite as much of a system pusher as, say, Donkey Kong Country or Star Fox, but the sprites are very detailed and the rest of the visuals are nice and colorful. The soundtrack is also one of the best on the Super Nintendo and arguably even of all time. Whether it be for its iconic melodies, fast-paced energy pieces, or the emotional masterpieces, Mitsuda really outdid himself with this one. However, the biggest thing I love about this game is its fun factor. This is just a game I can pick up right off the spot and instantly start having fun with. Unlike a lot of other RPGs where you look forward to the story more than the gameplay, Chrono Trigger is a barrel of enjoyment all the way through in both its gameplay and story. I'm serious here, this is probably the most fun I've ever had with an RPG, and maybe even with a Super Nintendo game in general. Chrono Trigger is often considered one of the greatest games of all time, and also a Squaresoft's magnum opus, and it's not hard at all to see why. With fun gameplay, an interesting take on the traditional RPG story, and superb visuals and sound, Chrono Trigger deserves its place as number 4 on this list. But before I move on to the next entry, I have to make an obligatory joke. Alright, that should tide me over for a while. Break out your magnifying glasses and funny looking hats, cause we've got a mystery to solve. With 66 votes, Persona 4. Certainly a unique take on the genre, Persona 4 combines styles of life simulation, dungeon crawling, and RPG to create a very refreshing take on the standard fantasy RPG. In this game, you are the new kid on the block at a small Japanese high school. At first, everything seems to be going great. You make a couple of new friends, and your life is pretty good for the most part. But then, various people are suddenly found dead hanging from television antennae. Okay... After investigating a rumor about watching a television after midnight, the main character and his new friends discover the TV world. Creative name, I know. Inside they meet a couple of new people and discover that all the people who had died had been sucked into the TV world on a foggy night before their death. 
With this knowledge, the main characters manage to escape the TV world and decide to form a team to rescue the victims and to investigate who or what is behind these attacks. In the TV world, it's your usual dungeon crawling RPG format. Roam around the dungeons battling shadows, finding items, and making your way down floors to the end of the dungeon where one of the missing people will be. Battles are triggered by contact with an enemy. In combat, you can attack with a weapon, skill, or item that you have acquired. If the enemy you are facing has a weakness, you can use an attack with that weakness to knock the enemy down and gain an extra turn. Just be careful because they can do the same thing to you. As for your other party members, you have the option either to directly control them or to use different commands and let AI work out the details. After a battle, you will get experience and money and you may get the chance to unlock a new persona. Personas in this game are basically your super attacks and are described as the manifestation of one's true self. It's a nice change of pace for the combat every once in a while. Outside of the TV world, the game plays out more like a life simulation game. As a high school student, your main character will do the things a normal high school student would do on an ordinary day. He'll go to class, form friendships, join sports teams, work part-time, all that fun stuff. It's like going to high school, minus the studying and the stress. This is the part of the game that either you're going to love or you're going to hate. For some people, it's fun just to go around and talk to people and lead a normal life when you're not beating down monsters. But for other people, it kills the flow of the game and they're just waiting for the fog to roll back in so they can go back to beating down monsters. Personally, I fall into the former category. I love this part of the game. The TV world is great for what it is, but the high school setting is just something I can easily connect to and I have tons of fun just going around and seeing what there is to see. It's also a fairly realistic portrayal of high school life. From worrying about an upcoming test to awkwardly trying to ask someone to a dance, it covers a lot if you take the time to look. I can definitely see why it would get in the way for other people, but I'm just not one of them. Other than that though, there's some other stuff to like about this game. In terms of visuals, there's little to complain about. While the graphics themselves aren't the best quality for the PlayStation 2, the game is still quite appealing to look at with a bright and colorful art style and several interesting locations within the TV world. The soundtrack is also quite massive, and most of the tracks are nice to listen to. I don't even have a personal favorite track, they're just all so wonderful. To wrap this segment up, Persona 4 is a very smart take on the RPG genre. With interesting gameplay, characters, story, and visuals, Persona is not only one of the most creative RPGs, but also one of the best. Mario! With 85 votes, Mario & Luigi Bowser's Inside Story. Mario may have gotten his start in the realms of platforming, but his RPG series is equally loved by consumers. Often described as the perfect RPG, Bowser's Inside Story does an incredible job of mixing what made Mario so great in the first place with the added elements of the RPG franchise to make a truly masterful game. As the game begins, toads have been getting sick and growing to ridiculous size all over the Mushroom Kingdom. The castle hosts a meeting to try and solve this problem, but Bowser interrupts. After being defeated, he is sold a mushroom that he believes will give him enough strength to finally defeat the Mario Brothers. However, it is actually a vacuum shroom that causes him to inhale Mario, Luigi, Peach, and Starlo into his body. Now, it's up to the Mario Brothers to silently guide Bowser on the path of good to stop Boffle, the person responsible for all these attacks. Right off the bat, this is a very interesting storyline compared to the Mario norm. It does fall into some of the same traps as the main series, but it all works out in the end despite this. And while it's not quite as dark or emotional as that of Thousand Year Door or even the original Paper Mario, it's not trying to be. It's just a lighthearted adventure filled with tons of fun and many, many chortles. The gameplay in this game is actually pretty unique for the genre. In the overworld, you control Bowser FINALLY as he travels through the Mushroom Kingdom to take down Fawful. At times, there are obstacles he cannot clear on his own, and that's where the Mario Brothers come in. 
From inside Bowser's body, the Mario Brothers have the job of helping him out when he needs it through minigames. They activate nerve endings, strengthen muscles, and unblock certain abilities in order for Bowser to advance. Battles are activated by contact. In battle, Bowser is stronger than each Mario Brother individually, but he has the disadvantage of fighting alone. If there comes a time when having two fighters is an easier task, Bowser can inhale the enemy and the Mario Brothers have to fight him. For either side, you select one of your various attacks and simply hit the enemy with it. However, this game implements the trademark Mario RPG action commands. After activating an attack, that's not all there is to it. You also have to use some timing and hit the button at the same time as the attack hits the enemy. A miss will result in no damage dealt, while a perfect hit deals maximum damage. This system is rather intuitive, and sure, it wasn't the first RPG to do it, but it was one of the finest due to the bonuses you get for better accuracy. This game has a good blend between difficulty and fairness. All the bosses are a lot of fun to fight, there's no major difficulty spike to be seen, and enemies can be taken out without too much hassle. It's overall a very fair challenge the whole way through. But wait, aren't we... Forgetting something? Yay! Ah yes, how can I talk about a Mario RPG without bringing up its humor? The Mario RPGs are known for having a large emphasis on their humor, and this game is no different. From Fawful's quips to Luigi's slapstick to Bowser literally listening to a little voice in his head, I can guarantee that this game will split your sides more than once. I could list off some examples, but Rabbit Luigi did a good enough job with that already, so I'll move on. Considering that this game came out on the DS, it has some very impressive aesthetics to behold. The sprite work in this game is very impressive, with tons of animation, detail, and color thrown into it. Also, the soundtrack is one of the best, from its whimsical main menu theme to the beastly Dark Star core. This game is filled with catchy and well-arranged music to listen to. Overall, Bowser's Inside Story is tons of fun and had a great spin on the characters we know and love. It's been praised universally by fans and critics, it's won several awards, had huge sales, and you've all named it the second greatest classical RPG of all time. Only one question left. What could possibly beat it? Take a wild friggin' guess. It's undeniable. Pokemon is the most successful, popular, and overall most beloved RPG series in history. Since it's the second best-selling video game franchise of all time, it's safe to say that a lot of us saw this one coming. It was an absolute landslide. Out of the 1,500 votes I counted for this contest, more than a third of them went towards a Pokemon game. Nothing else even came close. So, with that said, which game won? Which Pokemon game beat out all the rest to claim this number one spot? Well, with a whopping 132 votes, the greatest classical RPG of all time is... Pokemon Black and White 2. Hell to the yes! The most recent main series games to come out of this franchise, Black and White 2 are probably the most complete Pokemon games to ever be released. Oh believe me, they're not perfect, but they are the epitome of why we love these games to begin with. For the most part, Black and White 2 are your typical Pokemon adventure. Travel around, catch Pokemon, battle trainers, collect gym badges, defeat the Elite Four, and foil the plot of a criminal organization at the age of 10. All in a day's work. I won't bother going over the details because, frankly, if you don't already know them... I pity you. Let's talk about the story. The evil Team Plasma is back once again with a much more straightforward goal this time round. Steal other people's Pokemon and take over the world. Cliché, but effective. Along your path to becoming a Pokemon Master, you'll regularly come across Team Plasma and get roped into helping defend them off and recover stolen Pokemon. And that's pretty much it in terms of story. I mean, what do you expect? It's Pokemon. Black and White 2 take place two years after the events of the first two games, and in a new area of the Unova region. During your journey, you'll come across some familiar faces and some new ones. 
Several gym leaders return, some of which with completely remodeled designs and concepts. Bianca makes a return and is actually the one to give you your starter at the beginning of the game. Sharon now has become a gym leader himself, which is pretty cool but also pretty confusing. Hey, last time I saw you, your team was at, what, level 40 or something? What happened? Anne and Getsis also return, but not until the very end. As for new characters, you have a new rival who's a lot of fun. I'm glad they stuck with giving you a friendly rivalry rather than a bitter one. Also, there's a couple of new gym leaders around. And then, how can we forget Colress? He's a really cool character, and his type of choice, Steel, is rather unique among most major NPCs in the series. I don't know, personally I found him to be a bit, shall we say, disagreeable, but that's probably just me. Another thing that should be brought up is the soundtrack. Like many others, I believe Black and White 2's soundtrack to be the most well-constructed in the series. It's great to listen to, and it's well-made for the situations they accompany. Give it a listen if you haven't already. However, the thing that truly solidifies this game at the number one spot is one feature. One new mode that gives out nothing but absolute Pokemon bliss every time. The Pokemon World Tournament. Holy mackerel, I love this mode. The Pokemon World Tournament is a game mode you can unlock after your first playthrough of the main story. In this mode, you battle tons of trainers one after another from all over the Unova region and even from previous generations. It feels so great just to be able to go all out on a bunch of opponents in a row in a marathon of Pokemon goodness. Not to mention, the PWT can get very challenging in its upper tiers. The Champion Tournament in particular can be a massive pain to get through, but I love it every time. Wait, does that make me a masochist? Anyway, in case it wasn't painfully obvious yet, Pokemon Black and White 2 is a stellar duo of games. They have everything we love about Pokemon and then some, and that's more than enough to call them the greatest classical RPGs of all time. I'm the Phoenix King, and come on Gen 6!